hi guys welcome back to this channel and in this video i'm going to talk about how to write chapter 2 for phd thesis proposal so in my previous video i talked about how to write chapter 1 which is the introduction chapter so in this video i'm taking chapter 2 to be the literature reviewer so to begin with i want to talk about the role that the literature review chapter plays in the entire phd thesis proposal and the thesis itself so the literature review helps you to know the historical evolution of your topic that is how did the problem originate who started examining this problem who started researching on this problem and how has it evolved over time what are other researchers doing about their, that topic what are they finding so what is the current state of knowledge in your topic so this requires you to know and to, to read the most up-to-date literature on that particular topic. So once you know the historical evolution of that topic and, you've, and you know the current state of the knowledge in that topic, then you're able to really identify where the knowledge gap is. And then lastly, the literature review puts your study in the context of previous studies. So this basically means that uh, given the status, the current state of knowledge in that topic and what has been done before, what is your study aiming to, to do to achieve by looking at the same topic? What is it contributing to that particular body of knowledge? Once you understand the role of the literature review, the next thing I want to touch on is the, the key sections in the literature review chapter. And the first section, of course, is the introduction to the chapter. And this is a very short paragraph. It, it informs the reader about what the chapter is going to cover. After introducing the chapter, then the second section is the theoretical review. And the theoretical review section basically reviews the theories that inform your topic. So when you're doing a theoretical review, you need to ask yourself the following questions. The first one is who came up with that particular theory? What are the main arguments or what are the main tenets of that theory? How is the theory similar, similar to other theories within the same body of knowledge that is with addressing the same topic or problem under investigation? And how does it differ from those other theories? The fourth thing is what are the limitations of that theory? And then the last thing is how how does that theory apply to your own specific topic you also need to know that uh, in most topics there are many theories that try to speak to that particular topic so as a phd student you need to review all those theories that exist in your topic of study but at the end of that review you need to choose the one one or two at most that are applicable to what you're trying to study and when you're choosing that particular theory you need to give justification for why you have chosen that theory and not the others in that particular body of knowledge so after you've written out your empirical review the third section is the empirical review and under the empirical review it includes a review of the empirical studies that have been done by other researchers by empirical studies i mean original studies that involve data collection and analysis and writing out their findings. So you should include original studies under empirical review, not, not, not theoretical review studies. So empirical studies are data driven and not theory driven. And when you're writing out your empirical review, you need to acquire critical reading critical thinking and critical analysis skills or rather you need to adopt those lenses critical reading critical thinking and also through critical analysis when you when you're writing out the empirical review do not just merely report what the previous researchers have done and what they have found rather you should write in a way that is critically analyzing those studies their key limitations their key strengths and how they relate to each other, how they differ from others, how, how they are similar to other, other empirical studies. So in that sense, you need to review in reference to other studies. So there are various ways of organizing the empirical review. I'll mention two of them. The first one is the chronological organization. 
and this is organization by the date of publication. So you start with the older literature and move to the most recent literature. So chronological organization helps you to show the evolution of the state of knowledge over time. But the, the disadvantage of using this organization method is that it is not good for flow of ideas because uh, it focuses mostly on when the, the studies were published rather than how the studies are similar or different from each other. So the second way of organizing empirical reviews, the thematic organization, and this involves organizing studies that are similar together. Then you discuss them together. You can also organize by the variables of study, by the variables of the study. And this helps to create a smooth flow of ideas. And it, it is also easy to identify where the research gap is in each subtopic or in each variable of the study. And this method of organizing empirical review is the most preferred for PhD level studies. Once you have written out your, your theoretical review and your empirical review, then the next thing that you expected to write is the conceptual framework. And the conceptual framework is a diagrammatic representation of the variables of your study and how those variables relate to each other. It also helps to explain a phenomenon, um, how, how that phenomenon is and how it affects or is affected by other variables of the study. And of course, the conceptual framework is informed by the literature review. So you, you can't come up with a conceptual framework if you have not thoroughly uh, reviewed the existing literature. And there are three steps involved in creating the conceptual framework. And the first one is, of course, identifying all the variables that will be analyzed in your study. And then being, being specific in how those variables relate to each other, and then drawing a diagram that shows those variables and their relationships with each other. In the next slide, I'm going to show you some two examples of conceptual framework. So the first conceptual framework is sort of a conceptual framework that shows how adoption of M health is affected by other variables. And the variables are knowledge and awareness, government policies, access to mobile technology, ICT infrastructure, and the cost of M health services themselves. And this was done by, um, and this I got from a study that was done by Munua, Rotich, and Kimwele in 2015. Then the second conceptual framework shows how improved preventive maternal health care services is affected by M health applications, or rather, how M health implications lead to improved preventive maternal health care services. And this I got from a study that was done by Feroz, Pavin, and Aftab in 2017. So for you to be able to understand how conceptual frameworks are done, it's good to review journal articles that have conceptual frameworks, read through how, how they reviewed their literature, how the variables were identified, and how those variables and the relationships between those variables and how these two aspects, that is the variables and the relationships led to the development of the conceptual framework. The second last section of the literature review chapter is the research gaps. And of course, this can only be unearthed once you have conducted a thorough literature review. And this helps you to know what is already known and what is not known. So what, what is not yet known is what is referred to as the research gaps. And the research gaps is where your contribution to knowledge should lie. Your contribution to knowledge should emanate from addressing one or two or more research gaps that you have identified. There are a number of research gaps. So these can be gaps in the concepts or variables uh, that have been studied. So maybe you find that after reviewing um, the studies, after reviewing the literature, you find that most of those studies have focused on a few variables but have left out other variables that you deem to be important in explaining a particular phenomenon. So you can decide that your study is going to address those variables that have not been addressed adequately. The second research gap is the gap in the scope of study. So maybe the scope of study can be maybe the ge geographical reach or a particular population 
or um, a particular country. So this can also be a, a research gap that you can try to address in your, in your study. So there can also be gaps in the research methodology. So maybe the topic that you want to address has been examined qualitatively by most of those studies. So there's that gap in using quantitative methods to address that particular topic of investigation. So you can decide that your study is going to use quantitative research approach. And all this will lead to contribution to knowledge, which is very important, especially for a PhD level study. So the last section is the chapter summary and like the introduction to the chapter is a very short paragraph that summarizes the key points that have been covered in the chapter. So as I conclude, I wanted to point out a few things. So ch chapter two, um, in most cases, and for most students is usually the hardest and most involving because you have to really be aware of and you have to read many papers. You have to be aware of the current state of knowledge in that topic that you want to investigate. And for you to be able to do that, you need to read widely. You need to read up-to-date papers. And then the second thing is that literature review is an ongoing process. You can't say that a finished reviewing literature. This is because new publications come up each and every day, each and every moment of the day. So you have to really keep on reading, reading new papers that are coming up, reviewing them and adding uh, important points from those papers to your to your proposal. Um, and as I'd mentioned, you need to be always up to date with the new papers and publications that are coming up. And this really helps you to avoid duplication of effort. So if you're not familiar with, if you're not up to date with new publications, you might find that what you want to, to address has been addressed recently. And that will make your study null and void. So you, you want to avoid that. You want to avoid or the disappointment when you go to defend your thesis proposal and you get this comment from one of the reviewers that whatever you're trying to address has been addressed already. And they give you a reference to that study that has addressed what you're trying to achieve. And being up to date with new publications also helps you to, to be original. To be original in the sense that you're not doing what other people have already done. So to, be, to help you to be up to date with new publications, it is good to set alerts in the major journals and, and databases, including the Google Scholar. So setting alerts, you can set alerts by specifying um, maybe keywords or the topic of your study in those journals and in those databases, and then set alerts for them. When you set alerts, those journals or databases are going to notify you every time a new publication is published in your topic of study that you have specified in, when setting up the alert. And then it is always recommended to start with chapter two. You start with reviewing literature. You start by writing out the literature review chapter before you write chapter one. And the reason for this is that once you have identified the research gap from your literature review, it is when you're able to, to be clear about what you want to contribute to knowledge. And it is when you'll be able to know what your research problem is going to be and how you're going to address that research problem. So it is always recommended to start writing chapter two before now you go to writing chapter one. So um, with these few points, I hope you have learned one or two things. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to me. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.